I'm here today with Laura Paskus, who many consider, myself included, to be the savviest, most informed, and reliable environmental writer in the Mountain West. This is the first in a series of conversations between us about the most pressing issues affecting New Mexico's air, water, soil, climate, and land-based industries. Welcome to the New Mexico Mercury, Laura. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. It's awesome to be here. So here we are at the beginning of the irrigation season. Um, what's in store for us in this prolonged new world of climate change drought? That is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people are wondering that right now. Um, so irrigation season started a few weeks ago. People have started getting their water deliveries. Right now it's what? Uh, May, I mean, April 6th or so today yeah. when we're talking in the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, which is the, um, the, the organization that delivers the water in the Middle Rio Grande to irrigators and landowners and water rights owners. They have already started taking water from storage, releasing water from storage which is something that typically happens in mid-May or so. So we're real early. Early. There's not a lot of water in the river. There's not a lot of water in storage. So um, it's already here in early April. It's already a, a tough year. So what's the implication here? I mean, if we're if we're uh, sending water down early, if there's not much water in the river, if as we know the river runs dry from time to time now, and the Pecos as well, which I'm not really sure exactly how many days that is, but you know that. Yeah, so New Mexico's two largest rivers that supply a lot of water to a lot of people <laughs> um, have both been going dry in the summer. So last summer in 2012, beginning in June, the Rio Grande started going dry, and there were stretches that were still dry in October. The worst time of the year was mid-August when 53 miles went dry. And at that same, during that same period of time, the Pecos was also going dry. I think the Pecos, there were about 30 miles. So this is kind of the beginning, or perhaps the early middle of what it's going to look like if this really is climate change caused drought. Mm -hmm. And if this isn't just a, a prolonged nasty like it was in the 50s. Uh, it, is that an accurate assessment, do you think? Right. The drought that we're in right now is just as dry as the drought in the 1950s. Ah. So 2011 and 2012 were the two warmest and driest years on record in God. New Mexico. Um, but so we're, right now, we're just as dry as we were in the 1950s, but we're also warmer than we were in right, the 1950s. Course, yeah. So with climate change, we can expect to see that continue. The, um, it's clear that what's happening is New Mexico is getting warmer, the southwest is getting warmer, our growing season's longer now, um, the temperatures have gone up and are expected to go up another two to three degrees Fahrenheit in the next 70 to 80 years. Okay. Um, My heavens. Yeah. yeah, and so we're seeing less snowpack, earlier snow melt, more evaporation. So I know that the Bureau of Reclamation has, has done a long-term climate study about New Mexico and the uh, Middle Rio Grande Valley and other places here. What does that study say? So in 2011, Congress directed the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation to study how, or to assess how climate change was going to be impacting major western water basins. And so they've released some of the information from their study on the Rio Grande. And they're showing that there'll be a two to three degree Fahrenheit rise in temperatures over the next, in the 21st century. There'll be about a 2.3 to 2.5 decrease in annual precipitation, which translates to between a seven and 14% decrease in runoff. Yikes. Which is a big deal. That's a big, big deal. When we talk about steady rises in temperature and steady decreases in precipitation, we're not talking about a uniform rise or a uniform decrease. We're talking about a trend up. I mean, there will be some rain and some snow off and on, I suppose, but probably not as much as there was. And so has it become harder to plan? Uh, if you're an irrigator, uh, how do you... 
how do you run your business if you don't know if the climate has changed so dramatically that nothing is dependable anymore? I just want to make sure that people understand when it comes to climate change and looking at what what climate scientists are saying for the future. They're they're sure that the temperatures are going to rise for the southwest. The precipitation modeling is a little bit sketchier. Uh, um, okay. So, but my understanding is that in the southwest and here in the middle Rio Grande Valley, we'll see more, um, probably more summertime precipitation and less winter. Oh, oh, okay. So there'll be less snowpack. And, and really that's what sustains our, you know, that's what sustains the Rio Grande. And, you know, when the snowpack is easing down gently, it's perfect timing for your yeah. irrigation season. And, and that's great. Whereas those summer storms can be extreme. You can get a heavy downpour that just is very erosive. Right. And also our entire, um, the entire way that we manage the system, that the system is managed, is for catching snowpack and releasing that from reservoir to reservoir throughout the growing season. Right. We don't have a system to be catching that summertime precipitation. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. That's mm -hmm. quite a good insight. When it comes to uh, less and less water, um, one has to think about that old problem of water rights and who has senior water rights and who has junior water rights. Um, as um, our viewers probably know, we're, we're a prior appropriation state just like every other uh, state in the, in the West, which means that the people who use the water first uh, get the water first. So in an increasingly drying environment, um, you have situations like right now, I mean, early, early, early in the season, you have Carlsbad farmers who are so stretched out and so threadbare in terms of water that they're threatening to do what's called make a call on, on the Pecos River. Could you explain that to us a little bit? So making a priority call is a huge deal. <laughs> it is a huge deal. <laughs> Everybody in New Mexico should be paying attention to what's happening in Carlsbad and for who knows what could happen in the Rio, on the Rio Grande at some point. <clears throat> so making a priority call is basically when those senior water rights holders say, hey, in times of drought, in times of shortage, senior water rights are supposed to get their water first. And then when there's enough left over, then it goes to junior water rights. Um, but that's a really, really complicated thing because not to overgeneralize, but to generalize. <laughs> yes, it's all you can do. <laughs> Typically, um, senior water rights um, users are typically not the ones who have power and money right. in the state. Junior water rights users tend to be industry municipalities. People have come in later and and oftentimes gotten water rights or you know they're they're the junior water rights users. So if Carlsbad farmers on the Pecos River were to say, you know, we want our water first, and the decision was made to actually do that, um, there would be a lot of implications because sure, those farmers would get their water, municipalities would lose out, and when you think about it, um, it's not it's not cut and dry, it's not straightforward, um, because what if, okay, so just in an imaginary world where this happened and the, the senior water rights got their water and the junior water rights didn't, who would those senior water rights owners and those farmers be able to sell their alfalfa to? Good the point. dairies couldn't buy it because their mm. water's been cut off. Yeah. Um, so it's complicated and I don't envy anyone who has to make these decisions mm -hmm. because it's a, I mean, it's a tapestry. You pull one thread and, and everything starts unraveling. So I know Roswell is, is terribly worried that it's going to lose its dairy industry because it's upstream of Carlsbad. And of course, Roswell and Carlsbad have had a water war for as long as anyone can remember. But there's a, a terrifying example of what actually could happen. And it's what happened when, basically in broad generalities, Arizona made a call on California in 2002. Uh, California had been using um, probably about close to a million acre feet more than it should have. 
uh, because uh, because Arizona didn't basically have any use for it. And then suddenly the Department of Interior, interpreting the Supreme Court mm -hmm. in Arizona, Arizona versus California said, uh, look, now they need the water. They have, they have, they have the Central Arizona project and uh, you have to cut it off. And so here's Gail Norton, you know, uh, Secretary of Interior in those days. She goes to California Water Managers, has a little meeting in November and says, you guys are going to lose about 17% of your water. Huh. And by golly, you know, in January 1st, the clock went over that way and it was gone. Mm -hmm. Now the, the key and odd question in California was, was that it was very clear who lost the water and who didn't. The, uh, the irrigators, organics, uh, major industry farms, uh, agribusiness, all the rest, they didn't lose any water because they had senior rights. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles and San Diego had to cope with a 17% water loss. Uh, that's really a chilling a chilling vision, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you don't have any money like us. So I guess this leads then to, to another question. Um, uh, what is the implication of New Mexico losing um, its case with Texas in the Supreme Court uh, in however long it takes, however many decades it takes to come out? The thing to remember in the short term on the, um, the Texas versus New Mexico case on the the lower Rio Grande, if the Supreme Court does decide to take that case, it is going to drag on for decades and it's going to cost Texas and New Mexico millions of dollars. And I personally don't know if New Mexico in, in readying for this case is, you know, stockpiling those millions of dollars or, you know, I don't know. I don't know how that would be paid for, how we're preparing for that. But the case would be long and expensive and whatever measures need to be implemented, whatever decisions are made, is going to be really expensive and and difficult for a lot of people. And isn't there an issue here, uh, a very subtle issue about the differences between using surface water and pumping water and the relationship between surface water and groundwater? Mm -hmm. Just speaking of the, the Rio Grande, which is an area that I have covered more than the Pecos, the groundwater and the surface water are intricately tied to one another. Yes. So the nature of this um, this lawsuit in the Supreme Court between Texas and New Mexico is really um, uh, they're contending that we that we our our farmers are pumping too much water out of the groundwater obviously mm -hmm. and it impedes the flow of the river. Uh, how can they tell that if we don't monitor our wells? particularly. I mean, how do we know what we've got? The Rio Grande Compact was negotiated at the, you know, early part of the 20th century. And the the amount of water that the states are allocated was based on the hydrology of the river back then, right. which is different now. We right. have less water, we have more users, we understand things probably better than we did then. We have better data than we did then. So um, part of the problem is that the compact is set in stone. Right. And our our water supplies are not as, yes. you know, whether it's understanding better the connection between groundwater pumping and surface water or looking forward to climate change and how that's impacting our water supplies, that's going to be a huge challenge in sort of fitting our reality into the compact. Um, it's well said, yeah. But back to the groundwater monitoring. Um, so when the compact was negotiated and everybody agreed to it, there wasn't, there weren't that many wells right. in south of Elephant Butte which is the area they're talking about now, um, there weren't that many wells. I don't know the exact number, but, you know, there there may have been a handful. Right. Um, right. And now there are hundreds, if not thousands. And so Texas is saying that water, because of the connection, that water should be flowing. Instead, the surface water is getting pulled because the groundwater is getting pulled or the groundwater is not recharging right. the surface water. Right. So it's... Um, I don't want to side with Texas, but it's pretty clear that there's the the hydrologic reality 
is quite different now with all the wells that have been sunk there. There's a whole other kind of layer of problems also that we need to deal with. And I guess it's really the sort of the invisible question of pollution. The water world, I guess we could call it, is divided up into quantity people and quality people. And quantity people tend to dominate the discussions. Um, but quality is, is not unrelated to quantity, obviously. Uh, if you polluted your groundwater, it is basically removed. I mean, you can't use it, right? It's, it doesn't, uh, it's hard to clean up. It's, it takes years and years and years and years, and for all practical intents and purposes, it, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and so we have polluted an enormous quantity of our groundwater, particularly up, in, up, up near uh, the Sweet Spot Wells, uh, up near Ridgecrest, we have 24 million gallons of jet fuel, uh, either in it or seeping into it. Um, so what, um, how do we deal with that? Uh, and how do we calculate that into what we've got? Contaminated groundwater is a huge problem, not because, like I don't think anybody in Albuquerque, certainly not right now, and, and certainly not in the near future, nobody's drinking contaminated no, no, groundwater. No, it's no. not coming through your pipes no. or anything. But basically what it is, is that's, that's water that Albuquerque, a desert city, facing huge water challenges in its future, no longer has access to. And for me, that's the big issue. So there, I mean, there's the, the issue of 24 million gallons of jet fuel just being pissed away, basically. Yes. Um, and there's, you know, jurisdictional issues. You know, what can the New Mexico Environment Department be doing? What can the Air Force be doing? What should our congressional delegation be doing? Um, what do local citizens need to know? What does the water authority need to be doing? There, there's all these jurisdictional issues. There's funding issues. There's all of, the, I mean, it's hugely complicated. But if there's one thing that I wish that that people would remember when they see, you know, the great reporting that John Fleck at the Albuquerque Journal has exactly, done on, yeah, right. on it and, and other journalists too, is is that water is water we don't have for the future. And that is... That is a big problem. So it's kind of like we don't really have anybody, and I know this is going to anger some people when I say this, but we really don't have anybody who's overseeing the whole water picture in New Mexico. We don't have a champion, a person you know, who's, who's really looking out for us. We have all these divided interests, all, all of these jurisdictions. We don't even have a legislative body who's actually looking out for us. I mean, they didn't do anything this whole term about water. The governor certainly isn't interested in it particularly. Uh, the state engineer, I can't say that he's a champion. Um, we know that there is a, we know that Nevada has a champion, an enormously powerful person, who I'd love you to talk a little bit about and explain to our listeners, what the, our viewers, what, what she's done. And and maybe talk a little bit about the kind of person we need. So Patricia Mulroy, who is the person who makes sure that Southern Nevada gets its water and has a sustainable water future, which is a totally weird thing to say <laughs> about a city like Las, Las Vegas, Vegas. <laughs> sustainable. Um, but she had, you know, she fights with California and Arizona and, 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 takes water away from northern Nevada <laughs> to right. make sure that southern Nevada has it. And, and I don't know that that's necessarily what New Mexico needs, but New Mexico needs somebody. And and by saying that, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean for an instant to be insulting or taking away the work that people do for these individual agencies to, well, of to ensure, yeah. you know, of but there's nobody... And I, and this isn't just my opinion, like I've spent 10 years asking people, who's New Mexico's Pat Mulroy? Who, or who is the new Steve Reynolds? You know, for better or for worse, the old state engineer, Steve Reynolds, he was the water boss. He ran water in New Mexico. Exactly. Yeah. And I ask people all the time, who is, who's the Pat Mulroy? Who's the Steve Reynolds? Who's, who has leadership and vision on water? And and there are some great young attorneys out there, water lawyers, who are doing great work. There are amazing people within state and federal agencies who are not only 
smart and hardworking, but who really care about these issues yeah. and care about the state and the state of the water. But there's not that one person, and maybe there shouldn't be. Maybe yeah. that maybe that person would do bad things. But but it's hard to it's hard to look around New Mexico and wonder who are the leaders when it comes to water and who are the leaders who are going to bring New Mexico into this future when when there are so many people relying on water whether it's farmers or cities or businesses or uh, rivers that deserve to have water within their own banks and right. species that rely on them and we all like to see cottonwoods yes. um, <laughs> I mean who is really who really has that leadership and vision to to keep New Mexico alive and sustainable, and and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know either, of course, <laughs> naturally. Uh, but um, and you're totally right. I mean, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of dedicated people working on water in one way or another. Mm -hmm. But m many of them are in antagonistic situations with one another, and um, uh, which makes it difficult uh, uh, to have any massive planning. I think. Um, I don't know if Arizona has a water czar or if California does, uh, but I do know that I think the concept is a good one. Um, I'm not sure exactly why. I'm not a big guy on autocrats, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, if not one person, then perhaps a, a you know, a, a council mm -hmm. or something who, who always has all of us in mind and all of us in their hearts so they're looking out for all of us instead of just smaller interests each one of those interests is totally vital but what do you do with a situation where you have a state where you have many predatory states who are looking for any water they can get and looking for any loophole in the law and any minor transgression they can find to take water away from other places i mean i'm sure arizona and california and nevada and Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah are all looking at us. And Texas, and, you know, it, it doesn't even have anything to do with the Colorado compact, but it's looking at us, looking really strongly. So it it's, makes me feel very vulnerable that we don't have um, either a group of people, a small, discreet group of people, or one person um, who looks out for all of our interests. So I'm afraid our time is up, and I've just sort of hogged the last the last minutes here. But it's been wonderful talking with you, and I, I've just learned so much, and and uh, and I'm really glad we get to talk next time about air pollution, and the Four Corners, and all of those very complicated things. And of course, air also goes into the water, uh, eventually. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah.